So how and why do we measure torque? Uh, probably the most thing you're familiar with is, uh, again, uh, using a torque wrench to tighten a, a bolt on a car. The whole idea is that you want to make sure the bolt is tight enough so it stays, uh, um, keeps the parts fastened together. But we also want to make sure that we don't tighten it too much because we could potentially break a stud off of a wheel or what could happen is we get it on so tight we can't get it off later on. In industrial applications, uh, the situation is a little bit different. What we're talking about there usually is whether uh, a system is meeting specifications or whether there, uh, there is proper performance. Uh, in one case, you might have a test stand where you're trying to assess whether a pump is working properly or not. You might have an electric motor that's driving the pump. Well, the electric motor, you might be able to measure how much energy is going into it, and you can estimate what the losses are due to thermal effects, etc. So you might have a reasonable idea of what the energy is going into the pump. But the best way to actually measure it is by having a torque meter in there. Another situation might be in a petrochemical facility where uh, maybe you have a steam turbine uh, running a pump that's pumping some sort of uh, petrochemical fluids. And what can happen is the steam turbine can get fouled, you can get buildup on the blades inside the turbine, or you can get uh, a buildup of material on the pump itself. So you can realize that you need to put more energy into the system in order to get the proper flow out of the pump, but you don't know where the problem is. So if you put a torque meter between the steam turbine and the pump, you can see how much energy is delivered out of the turbine. So you can figure out whether the problem is in the turbine or whether the problem is in the pump. And that's what happens in a lot of the applications uh, that we do. Another thing it might be is that on startup, a customer wants to make sure that a steam turbine is operating the way it's supposed to. If he's putting in a certain amount of energy, is he getting a certain amount of energy out? We have had one particular situation that I've heard about a story where actually the steam turbine wasn't working properly and uh, the steam turbine company sent the torque meter back to us and said it wasn't working properly. Well, we checked it and it was working just fine. It was the steam turbine that was not working properly. So it's a perfect example where this thing can uh, be a big factor. Here we have a test stand actually for a, uh, a small gas turbine. We have an intake over here, it's kind of hard to see, and this is the exhaust area. Uh, this is the load over here, which is a pump, and in here you can't hardly see it in this particular picture, but there is a coupling in there with a torque metering system on it. And here's that coupling. What a coupling is, it's a spacer tube, hollow tube usually, and it has these uh, elements on the end, flexible elements. Kind of hard to see, but you can picture it's kind of like a pancake and you're bolting the outside of the pancake and the inside of the pancake is attached to the shaft. And what that does is it allows for some misalignment between the two pieces of machinery at both ends, if there's uh, uh, diaphragms at both ends, and it also allows a certain amount of stretch and compression as the, uh, either the load or the uh, driver uh, heat up and expand. So the system uses a strain gauge, and, and what is a strain gauge? Well, here's an example of a simple one. Uh, if you do some work in a lab with strain gauges, you might be familiar with this type of gauge. And um, basically what it's doing is it's measuring stress and to get back, or strain, excuse me, strain. Well, what exactly is strain? It's actually a measurement of how much a piece of material stretches per unit length. So if we take a 10 inch long piece of steel and maybe we stretch it 10 mils or 10 thousandths of an inch, we're talking about one unit of stretch over a thousand units of length. You could also say that that's a thousand units of stretch over a million units of length. And that would be called a thousand micro strain. So the micro is again a millionth. And that's kind of the area that we're working in when we talk about torque meters. We're talking about a thousand microstrain or something that's the order of a ten thousandths of an inch over a ten inch length. The force required to stretch that material is going to vary depending upon how thick the, thick the material is, how wide the material is. So it's not really a force that we're talking about here. We're talking about how much the material itself stretches. And we actually make torque metering systems that will 
uh, go up to 1.2 million inch-pounds of torque and that's pretty significant. 1.2 million inch-pounds is a hundred thousand foot-pounds of torque. That's a lot of a lot of torque on something. That spinning at about 2,000 RPMs, which are relatively low rate, is actually 38,000 horsepower. So we're talking about systems that really can measure large amounts of torque. 38,000 horsepower, 28 megawatts of energy. So how does the strain gauge work? Basically this thing is nothing more than a fancy variable resistor. And if it stretches in this direction, it changes its resistance. And it does that because what this is, is this is a material that's deposited on a substrate. The material might be something called constantine, which is a copper nickel alloy, or it could be karma, which is a nickel chromium alloy. Depends upon the application, what kind of strain gauge you use. The substrate is, could be polyamid or some other kind of plastic that's stretchable. A strain gauge like this might have a resistance of 250, 350, or 1,000 ohms. That's, those are typical values. When we're measuring torque, the simplest thing to do is use something called the strain gauge bridge. And what this is, it's actually four strain elements, strain gauge elements, mounted on one particular device. And you'll notice that they're mounted at 45 degrees to the vertical here. And there's two in this direction and two in this direction. So two of them will react to stretching in this direction, stretching or compression, while the other two react in the opposite direction. And here's a picture of the strain gauges oh. mounted in strain gauges oh. mounted inside uh, an actual. That one's going. Good. They're actually mounted here. They get epoxied to the inside of the shaft. This shaft is, is actually about a foot in diameter. And in this particular case, we're actually using uh, strain gauge devices that have two elements. And what the wiring is doing is connecting all of these elements together to form uh, this strain gauge bridge. When we talk about that, by a bridge, we're talking about four elements that get uh, connected together in a configuration like this. We're talking about using a 1,000 ohm strain gauge bridge, which is what we use. It really has those four resistive elements, and they get connected in an arrangement like this. You provide uh, excitation at the top and the bottom, typically plus 5 volts, minus 5 volts, and you measure the voltage that comes out here. Uh, if you know a little bit about electronics, this is a voltage divider, as this is, and because these values are all equal, uh, what would happen is the voltage that gets generated across here is really zero volts. Here's a representation of a coupling or a spacer tube and the gauge would be mounted uh, thus and it would be in a relaxed state with no torque applied. It would be perfectly rectangular. And what happens is as you apply torque, this actually twists. Even though this thing is made of steel, it will actually twist. Might not be easy to see, but it happens. This is an exaggerated picture. It really wouldn't twist that much. But what happens is these parts would stretch and these parts would get compressed. So if we go back to our picture of our strain gauge bridge again, we'd end up with two elements here that get stretched and two elements that get compressed in that particular case. And actually, we have a little uh, sample of a uh, noodle here that you might find in a swimming pool. And what it is, is just to show you that, yeah, what actually happens is as this torque is applied, that a rectangle actually deforms, and two of the corners come closer together, and two of the corners go further away. So just like we talked about. Now, of course, it wouldn't stretch or rotate that much, but it's enough. So in a typical application, the amount of change in resistivity might only be one ohm out of a thousand. And so what we see here is these two values go up by an ohm, these two values go down by an ohm, and if we applied our plus and minus five volt excitation here, what we generate across this area here, these two signal points, would be 10 millivolts. Not a lot of voltage, but certainly enough to work with. And that is actually a typical 
full load output from strain gauge bridge. So how do we take this and generate usable uh, information? In many laboratory applications, we merely use something called slip rings. These are nothing more than brushes, uh, brushes that contact uh, surfaces on the coupling, and they make the electrical connections. Well, since this is a uh, rotating device, the brushes will wear over time. It might be good for laboratory application where you're doing intermittent use, but it's not good for continuous operation. So for continuous operation, you need a non-contact method for getting information out of the coupling. Here's a rendering, a representation of uh, a coupling. And we have this a rotor stator arrangement here. There are actually windings in the stator, which is the stationary part. And there are also windings on the outside of the shaft, which is the rotating part. And what these windings do is they form uh, basically rotary transformers. One of the windings is stationary and one of them rotates. So we're able to get power into the coupling. We run electronics that are mounted down at one end. They power up the strain gauge. The strain gauge gives a small output. The electronics here will amplify that and convert it into a different kind of signal that we can pass out through the rotor and stator out to some external electronics. And that's basically how the system operates. So in our example, we're talking about a resistance change of only a tenth of a percent for this 500 microstrain uh, applied torque. And uh, again, we're talking about 10 millivolts output. And so, again, the 500 microstrain, which is typical for a torque meter, we're talking about a change in length of that one inch strain gauge of only 0 0.0005 inches. A very small amount. Not anywhere near what this demonstration is. It's a very small amount. And that is a 0.05% change in length, very small, generates a 0.1% change in resistance values, 0.1% output voltage, but we amplify that and get a usable signal. So here's our typical system. Uh, we have a monitor and what the monitor does is it produces a DC voltage and it runs down a long cable to these local electronics. The local electronics take the DC, convert it into an AC because we need to be able to get through this transformer arrangement to get power into the coupling. So we get power inside, it runs the electronics, runs a strain gauge, produces a signal which ends up being a variable frequency signal. Torque is converted to variable frequency and comes back out through the uh, rotor and stator arrangement to the local electronics which will then condition the signal so that it can go a long distance, maybe a couple thousand meters, back to wherever this monitor is located. So here's our monitor and uh, what the monitor is doing is it actually takes the variable frequency, converts it into a torque value and applies calibration so we get an accurate reading. We'll actually have some sensors in the rotating parts and in the stator so that we get pulses as the uh, shaft rotates. Those pulses are also converted into a speed signal uh, in the monitor. And then the monitor takes the speed and the torque and can calculate power so we know just how much power is being uh, generated. And here's the simple formula. It's horsepower is equal to torque in inch-pounds times speed in RPM. Uh, divided by 63,000 and a similar equation for uh, kilowatts. These systems are uh, designed for long-term operation. We actually have systems that have been out in the field for uh, since the 70s and we know this because they come back for periodic calibration. So these things are designed for long-term operation. In many cases in petrochemical facilities, these things will be installed and they may run for a couple of years before they have a shutdown. Thank you.